think whether they should remain or leave the EU. And then we're going to open up the floor, so if you have any questions for either side, um, up to you to ask. So, just want to open with like what the EU is, why we've got this referendum, and who is going to be speaking in front of you today. So, the EU was founded after World War II, uh, just six countries to start with, and now there are 28, and it's an economic and political partnership between those 28 members. Um, and one of the main goals is to promote human rights, so to enter the EU, you need to be abiding by those laws and treating your citizens in the way that the EU would recommend. So the idea is just a free movement between, of goods and people between these members. So we've um, opened a referendum. Uh, the government has decided that they wanted a referendum before the end of 2017. Um, the Prime Minister, although he wants to stay in the EU, wants um, changes. So, for example, lower benefits paid to migrants that come in. Um, and obviously we've boycotted a couple of the changes made to the EU. For example, we're not uh, using euros as currency. So that's something that maybe we're already stepping out of the EU as it is. Um, and critics believe that Britain would, is being held back by the EU, that there's too many tight controls and that we pay more in than we get out. Um, but those who want to stay in the EU think that that shows stability and we don't actually know what would happen if we left. So, um, yeah. I uh, just want to say a special thank you to some people who helped organise who aren't actually up here today. So Thomas, Sam and Henry who really did help organise all of this and yeah. So on our panel today on um, Remain or to stay in the EU <laughs> is Maran on that side. So she's president of the SU and a member of the Youth Parliament for Brighton and Hope. We've got Cyrus who's chair of the Socialist Society and future Cambridge physics student. Um, on this side, we've got Jack, um, who's a political editor of Right and Left. He's written over 100 published articles and appears on 80 ra different radio episodes. And Felix, a uh, renowned political commentator. And <laughs> I didn't write that. <laughs> and future Oxford PPE student. So I'm going to pass it over to Felix to start on the exit side. So, Felix. <laughs> anti-democratic and neoliberal. After the Second World War, European elites realised that, uh, that the people of Europe voted and supported communist, Nazis, fascists, and so they sought to reduce democracy in the hope that this couldn't happen again, to take public policy making away from the public and instead put it into the hands of remote, unaccountable technocrats. The European Union has essentially three major institutions, the most powerful of which is the European Council. The European Council sets broad policy agendas and then thrashes out their finer details. Now, in a normal democratic state, these functions will be carried out through Parliament, in the public eye, scrutinised and attacked at every point to ensure the public supported them. In the European Union, they're carried out entirely behind closed doors, and so the public don't know what's going on, they have no influence on what's going on, and the only people who do have influence are corporate lobbyists, of which there are 15,000 living in Brussels. The second most powerful institution is the European Commission, an organisation comprised of entirely unelected and unaccountable European bureaucrats, and the third is the European Parliament. Admittedly, it has some power, and it is democratic, but it doesn't have nearly enough, and it's still ultimately remote and distant from the European people. Because the European people have so much influence over these institutions, those that do tend to be large capitalist firms uh, and the capitalist elite of Europe. This has led to the European Union making divisive, Austerity and austerity regimes across Europe and enforcing neoliberalism. In, uh, in, when crisis hit after 2008, the European Union pushed extreme neoliberal reforms in the poorer states, offering them bailouts on the condition that they would neoliberalise, marketise, privatise, and sell off their state assets. This happened in Ireland, Italy, Greece, Portugal, Spain, all of these countries. And in Italy and Greece, where the governments refused to comply, the EU colluded to push out the democratically elected government and to implement instead EU-supported technocrats such as Mario Monti in Italy and Pat Andreou in Greece. The EU further, uh, this isn't enough for the EU, who then introduced in 2012 the EU Fiscal Compact, which makes it illegal, I'll repeat, illegal, for any EU government to not implement austerity. They have to cut their budget deficit, they have to cut their debt, otherwise they'll be fined and sanctioned. This is far more extreme than anything that the Tories are doing in Britain. 
The EU also wants to implement transatlantic trade and investment partnership, a trade deal with the US that will allow private companies to sue the British government if we introduce policies that reduce their profits. A private banking firm could sue the government for billions of pounds if we introduce, say, plain packaging. And finally, EU directives and laws um, mean it will be incredibly legally difficult to ring out like the railways, telecoms, gas or electricity. If you oppose democracy, if you support democracy, <laughs> if you oppose democracy, then you should support the European Union. But if you support democracy, you oppose austerity, and you oppose neoliberalism, there is no option other than to vote to leave on June 23rd. Like protesting about this, 
But somehow for the European Union, that's fine, you know, we just accept that we move on. We shouldn't accept that. We, ca we cannot continue to be made part of a union that dislikes the thing it claims to protect, which is liberal democracy. And so, as Felix said, and I will say again, if you like democracy, if you dislike the very idea of being able to make decisions and to vote for people who are actually accountable to you, not a bunch of bureaucrats, you should vote leave on the 23rd of June. I'd say actually um, the, the, the deal that Cameron got was actually quite reasonable um, given, the, given the kind of right wing slant of um, the, the Brexit debate at the moment um, he chose fairly kind of reasonable policies to go in there with but um, I mean it's been brought up um, the issue of democracy the European Union is arguably the most ambitious post-war international project in the world the aim is to stability the aim was to, uh, to stabilise, unite and strengthen a troubled continent through joint endeavour and through a common market union that will allow the nations of Europe to maintain global influence in a post-colonial post age that sees the rise of new superpowers, new threats and new challenges. But also there are new opportunities. Our generation is defined by being the first to live growing up in the new internet era, a time when free information, free communication and the freedom that comes with, um, with those are abundant. The internet is a European creation, pioneered by scientists collaborating at CERN, the most advanced scientific research facility in the world um, that the world has ever seen, making discoveries that will um, echo throughout generations, made possible by the spirit of camaraderie and cooperation that we should all aim to share. The aim of scientific endeavour, um, while pure for those of us who love it, has always, been to, has always been advancement. On a practical level, the true aim of basic research is to allow technological advances that benefit us all. By working together in this way, we ensure that Europe um, remains at the forefront of an exponentially changing, changing technological and economic environment. The only hope for, um, for relatively small European nations to stay um, in, in a, uh, to remain competitive in um, a new world of the industrial powerhouse of China and the emerging economies of India and South America. Through the EU, we have access to the biggest single market in the world, and Britain, as the, sing as the um, single largest economy in the Union, is in a prime position to get all the advantages and benefits that this brings. I submit to you that while the EU is not perfect, together with progressive social values, work and consumer rights, and ever greater cultural exchange that makes, that makes us stronger in the face of growing challenges in the world through terrorism and um, evolving ideology, the opportunity that the EU brings for solidarity in Europe is too great to pass up. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, so if any of you have any questions, just pop your hand up. Um, we've got a microphone going around. Yeah, we do. We have a microphone going around. Did you hear that? Could you repeat that? So why should we have any faith in the Euro's ability to reform? So um, I'm sure we're all aware, um, Felix mentioned it, the, um, the crisis that happened in Greece. A prominent figure in this um, crisis was a man called Yanis Varoufakis, who was um, the Greek finance minister at the time. He's now the ex-Greek finance minister um, because of having failed to uh, meet the EU's demands. Um, Again, as a, as, a, um, as a proponent of democracy, as a, um, someone who identifies with the left um, of the political spectrum, I'm appalled by what happened in Greece. But leaving the EU won't make any of those things better. Um, the only, the things that we need to do, is possible to, um, to reform Europe. I, I reject the claim that, that Europe is this kind of, um, this kind of, closed off, um, God-given um, creation, it's, it, all, all of our unions are made by people, right? All it takes is a constitution, I mean, it's, 
not going to be easy, but um, I propose that we have a constitutional reform um, and a constitutional summit among um, European countries um, to grow from the ground up um, a new, more democratic Europe. Um, this, there's a campaign going on at the moment which I recommend everyone checks out called Democracy in Europe 25, um, which is endorsed by people like Caroline Lucas, um, Yannis Varoufakis himself, um, and Noam Chomsky, lots of um, people that I'm sure um, many of us here admire. And so um, they campaign for increased transparency, um, things like live streaming meetings, keeping minutes, which they don't do at the moment. Um, and in the long term, yes, um, bring together a constitutional convention to um, rebuild from the ground up the democratic structure of Europe. Thank you. Um, any other questions?
that would close our borders and that would abandon the cultural diversity that this country should be celebrating. You make, to be honest, a really good point, and it's one of the few things that makes me reconsider my support for Brexit. But I think you said that why do I support the side that wants to close our borders? The truth is, I don't support that side. I support the side that says the British people should be able to control our borders. Now, personally, I think immigration is a brilliant thing. It improves our country economically, culturally, socially. I think that cultural diversity is a great thing. But at this point in time, the British people feel like immigration has been imposed on by a European elite, that they haven't chosen it themselves. So what I would say is, let's leave the European Union, let's take back control of their borders, and then you and I and everyone else who is left with it and supports immigration should make the case to the British people that open borders are a good thing, that immigration is a good thing for this country. And then we won't have immigration imposed upon us from outside. We'll have immigration and cultural diversity that we, the British people, have chosen. So leaving isn't, isn't a straight choice between stay and have cultural diversity and leave and be enclosed up into a little England. It's we can leave and then shape our country the way we want it to be shaped, win the argument and open ourselves, not just to Europe, but in fact to the entire world. example of um, any time that the left has ever benefited from retreating to the nation state. Borders, walls and separation between people only furthers the far right, a growing sentiment in Europe. The, the, the foundations of the left ideology is solidarity with people throughout the world and recognising that we have more in common with the working people of Germany, the working people of Greece, the working people of France and the work, working people of Spain than we ever will do with the likes of David Cameron and the people that are currently running our parliament. But that's about how has... <laughs> how on earth can you, like you're saying, the true, like the rise of nationalism is worrying, but the European Union's attitude to left-wing parties, left-wing government, is utterly contemptible and outrageous. What they've done in Greece, the Greeks signed a memorandum which means they cannot the Greek Parliament cannot make any legislation on any area of policy without the approval of the European Commission. This wouldn't happen with the right wing government, but the utter contempt that they have for anything that's moderately anti-austerity, moderately left wing, they just they, they just shut down and refuse to engage with. Well, you keep bringing up the slightly, you keep bringing up the point that um, that that Europe is um, enforcing austerity, but um, but the British people. Like I didn't see, I I didn't feel that the sentiment here was um, that much anti-austerity when well, I I don't really agree with the point. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, um, uh, sorry, I I've, I've lost my. <laughs> we'll go to the next question. How, without a big supernatural organisation, keeping stability, keeping safety, can you 
Commission and more directly why it works. You're absolutely right that one of the main functions of the EU was set up for was to prevent war, and I did gloss over that. But I think, well, the EU attempted to prevent war on two bases. One, by integrating the economies of Western Europe so that their war making economies would be so interlinked that they couldn't go to war without destroying their own economy. Now, over the last 70 years, uh, more than 80 years, of European integration, the war making economies of not only Western Europe but all of Europe have become so utterly interlinked and interdependent that this function has already been achieved. We could abolish the European Union, the single market, tomorrow, and we would still wouldn't be able to go to war with each other without destroying our own economy. Secondly, you spoke about how can we prevent war in Europe without a supranational organisation designed to mediate conflict between states. And that's true, that is vitally important. And the EU has to an extent provided that function, but that function is also provided with, by a far larger uh, organisation, the United Nations. Also, by the Council of Europe, an organisation separate from the European Union that helps to promote democracy uh, and respect between states. I would say this, the European Union was set up to promote war between states. It's now accentuating the division creating a split between the rich north of Europe and the poor south, between the liberal western uh, west of Europe and the nasty reactionary east of Europe. The migrant crisis uh, and the economic crisis have only served to accentuate these divisions. So if we want genuine solidarity between European nations, let's break up the European Union and work together as allies, as comrades across Europe through the UN, but not um, in this false and artificial union. Do you honestly believe that we could leave, you, you said at the start that we could leave the um, single market tomorrow and everything would be fine economically, do you honestly believe that? Um, I don't think I actually did ever say that because I don't believe that. I think, let's be honest, if we leave the European Union, we'll go into an extended period of financial uncertainty, of economic difficulty, GDP will probably drop. These are some hard truths that we need to acknowledge, but personally I feel like democracy, the ability to run our own country, the ability not to have to follow neoliberal and divisive EU regulations, um, in the long run will benefit this country. And if the left is concerned with this country, as I certainly hope it is, then we can in the long run rebuild an even greater prosperity than we have than the, that that we have within the European market. That's that's easy to say for us living here in Brighton, going to Basic and um, whatnot, but there are people struggling throughout Britain who can't handle an economic downturn of the scale of 2008, which many econo economists have predicted. Um, us leaving could easily lead to, lead to um, the breakdown of Europe in general, but just the general, um, um, just the general uncertainty in the market, um, combined with China's downturn, could cause um, another massive um, um, global crisis. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, scaremongering in um, the European debate, but um, I, I submit also that um, it would probably be, it would be an even worse mistake to um, to overreact to scaremongering by um, by under considering the um, the debate. This is a very serious issue with very serious consequences, and it's not like if we leave, everything's just going to go on as normal. There will be very um, massive economic um, consequences. You also mentioned the refugee crisis. I don't see how um, the, uh, an issue of, like the refugee crisis, where currently there's more people um, displaced in the world than there have been since World War II, um, can be solved by any, any other means than um, wide European collaboration, which is exactly what the EU is there to uh, provide. One thing I'd like to mention is the Good Friday Agreement, uh, which was enforced by the European Union, which um, has, is enforced the borders in Northern Ireland, of which now um, would mean we have to relocate the borders with Ireland in uh, the peace agreement with Ireland itself, um, which could potentially escalate to war, which she said would be impossible. Yet, however, We've seen many people in Northern Ireland want this separatism over the years, and they may be for it. We may see a war escalate, and without the uh, protection of the European Union itself, we could face ourselves at war with all of the European Union if it escalated. If not, we may simply lose all of Northern Ireland and forfeit because of it. So that was the issue with Northern Ireland if we leave.
please. Um, the issue with Northern Ireland is an interesting one, but the point about it is that the actual agreement is enforced by the European Convention of Human Rights rather than the U less so the European Union, and, which is actually, and the European Convention on Human Rights has nothing to do with the European Union. It is separate. As Felix talked earlier about the Council of Europe, that is what enforces um, the um, Good Friday Agreement and the European Convention on Human Rights. The idea of war, I mean, true there are very volatile and negative forces in Europe at the moment, but the idea that if we leave, it's all going to, like, the whole continent is going to go to shit and, you know, it's just going to turn into sort of a 1939 bloodbath again, I think is a little bit extreme, and I, and I, and I think it's, I, I just, I just can't see it happening. Um, uh, yeah, I, go for it, actually. Um, okay, go for it. Okay. Um, so I, I do agree with that. I, I do think um, claims that um, Europe will descend into war if we leave is a bit, is a bit um, extreme, but that's because of the, um, the incredible unifying influence that the European Union has had by, um, engage, by, by, engaging in, um, by engaging in joint endeavours and by um, working together generally for the, you know, or at least attemptedly for the common good. Um, we've developed um, a far greater kind of European identity that's brought everyone together. I don't see how that's a bad thing. I don't, dis I don't disagree that, um, that the European Union is in many ways dysfunctional, in particular the, the Eurozone, but that doesn't mean that we should just leave and give up on the whole thing altogether. Because that, that's not going to make like, a, a massive difference. I mean, after 2008 and the economic crash, we, we are in the European Union for a reason. We are working together as all these countries, and the idea about the single market trade and we, we, are able, we are able to trade easier, we are able to work together with different countries, we are able to do so much more together and united than if we are alone and just not being able to do the things that we were able to do before. We already have everything set in place. If we just reform it and become a better nation and better together, it's a, a, a much easier alternative than just leaving. Thank you very much. A uh, couple of the back that have had their hands up for a while. Um, Felix, I agree. Um, let's not just follow President Obama. Yes, America wants to stay in the EU, but let's do that. But you also need to examine why, why might Putin want us to leave? You, um, England was instrumental in engineering the sanctions that the EU has, in, has placed upon Russia. And Russia has a huge amount of influence over Germany, all of its major supplies of gas. If we leave the EU, Russia has a huge amount of influence over Germany, we would then be able to reverse the sanctions that we place on Russia. There are definitely some strategic advantages uh, for Russia if we were to leave the European Union. However, the situation in Ukraine is one created and exacerbated by the European Union itself and not Putin. Ukraine has historically always been within Russia's sphere of influence, and as much as we may detest that, we have to acknowledge that it's true. The European Union has continued an eastward push alongside NATO right up to the borders of Russia. It tempted Ukraine with a deal to allow it into the European Union. When Ukraine decided uh, to give it access to the European economic currently, when Ukraine turned that deal down, the European Union uh, assisted the Americans in backing the euro maiden coup, which removed the democratically elected government and put in place a new government partially supported by fascist elements in Ukraine. Now, the fact is that the crisis in Ukraine is caused by the European Union, uh, and when Putin has changed, it is to some extent, I think we have to say legitimate, especially compared, I mean, I don't want to apologise for the actions of Putin, but... In comparison to what America has done, uh, in, uh, ultimately we have to it is his own uh, sphere of influence, and uh, therefore the, it, it is to some extent legitimate in rebuffing European expansionism. Yes, the European Union would help Putin to some extent. Uh, yes, it would probably lead to the dismantling of the sanctions regime, although most likely I think the sanctions regime is going to come down anyway because the Americans are going to be forced to work with Russia and Syria. So, uh, yeah, it's essentially it's messy. I think the European Union would damage the European security interests in some ways, but it would also increase in others uh, by making an to EU expansion. Thank you very much. We're just going to move to the remaining side. I think it's a bit dishonest to claim.